right. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Book Break. My name is Claire. I'm a librarian here at the Greece Public Library, and I moderate as the Page Turns Book Club. Today, my special guest is my fellow librarian, Lisa, who does a lot of our creative programs here at the library and also is an avid reader. Tell me, Lisa, like, what are some of the things you typically like to read? Um, well, I really like to read um, historical fiction. I'm not really in another thing that I've really gotten into as an adult is I love sci-fi and fantasy. Mm-hmm. Um, like for example, one of my favorite series was uh, is Outlander. I love reading that. I like reading anything that has to do with animals. Um, I love gardening and herbs, so I love things that involve um, pe- like witches, witchcraft, using herbs medicine, for medicine, things like that. So, but I'm really open to reading uh, anything. I'm the one only thing I haven't really read a lot of is uh, our biographies. I'm I'm not really big into biographies or not or autobiographies. Yeah, you don't like people. Well, I do like people. I just I don't know. It it depends on the person, I guess. Yeah, I like certain biographies, like musical people. I don't know, just people that sometimes I find interesting, but. I can't read, like, the big political chunk of chunks, you know, that are 800 pages. Oh, yeah. Neither can I. I get really bored. And I also really like to read cookbooks. One of my favorite cookbooks, I I never made anything from the cookbook, but I love reading all the stories behind the recipes was Maya Angelou's cookbook. I just love it. So I I find those really interesting as well. Yeah. No, I'm a big, huge cookbook fan. Oh. So my first book today, today we're just going to do like a roundup of what Lisa and I have been reading lately. But my first one was A Fate Inked in Blood by Danielle Jensen. And I would classify this as one of those romanticy books. Mm -hmm. Um, My daughter and I picked it for Book of the Month Club. And I definitely feel like it would be a book that would have younger appeal. Um, But here's the setup. There's A Shield Maiden. Okay, oh. we're set in like a Norse world. Oh, I love that. Um, and sh- she has been blessed by the gods to supposedly unite a nation under a power-hungry king. Um, so it's a very Norse-inspired Viking-type mythology. But when it, the book starts, Freya is her name. She is in an unwanted marriage. She's kind of her family really doesn't treat her that well. Um, but she spends her days, like her, her husband, his gifts, if you were, will, like, if there's fish in the sea, they'll all jump on the thing. Like, he keeps his village well fed, okay. but he's really kind of an ogre to her. So she's gutting fish, dreaming of being oh, a warrior, and figuring out how she's going to get away from her husband. But Sounds her, like a wonderful relationship. Oh, yeah. To, yeah cutting just, fish. Just really inspiring. Uh, but anyway. Hey, can I interrupt real quick? I have a hard time with this. When when were the Vikings? Oh gosh, I don't know. Is it the 1400s? You know, I'm sorry to derail it everybody, but we I, talk a lot about Vikings and sort of Norse mytho- mythology on this podcast and if you're like me, maybe you're wondering when the Vikings were actually a thing. So I think the Vikings <laughs> were just basically raiders. They didn't wear a lot of the stuff that they have, the horned hats and all that. That they really didn't wear that stuff. It's the, that's the, the creation of raiders. Gotcha. So that's like a, a romantic romanticization of it. Yeah, oh, I, I okay. think that they've definitely over romanticized. They have, and that's one thing I didn't. Well, I'll get to why okay. I liked or didn't like this book. So I'll get us back on here. It looks like the Viking Age was seven hundred ninety three to ten sixty six. Oh wow! All right, I'm out of here. Off. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, Freya's dreams become reality when her husband betrays her to the region's Jarl, which I'm assuming is like the the ruler of the mm-hmm. region. Um, landing her in a fight to the death against his son Bjorn. Of course, to survive, Freya has to reveal her secret, which her parents told her never to reveal, which is she is a shield maiden. So she has a drop of goddess blood, which she can kind of shield herself from any harm happening to her. So, So she can repel an attack. So naturally, as Vikings who raid other villages, which is what they do in here, the yeah. territories are constantly, oh, you got food? Oh, fine. We'll come take yours. Um, they yeah. want somebody that can repel an attack. 
I, I those shield maidens or something else. I think that's so cool that the women fought just as you know brutally and as the men did. Yeah, yeah. So that's what she wants. Okay. But anyway, of course, what this book is really about is the guy that is a king. He's also kind of a. He's not that much better than her husband, mm -hmm. actually. Um, actually, no one in this book is is really <laughs> that great. Um, but she loves comes to find herself finding falling in love with his son who he has ordered to protect her at all costs because she's a very valuable commodity okay. um of course as soon as her power is revealed all the other jarls or whoever all want her too because yeah. everybody wants to be king everybody wants the shield bane right but um oh. so it should be it should be good if, if you really like that romanticy with lots of lust, you know, sex, yeah. it's very little Norse world building. It's more about the romance. She okay. is a very strong female protagonist, but she's extremely loyal to her family, mm -hmm. which I couldn't figure out because it's like everybody uses you for whatever they want. Yeah. You know, her family used her marriage to gain a better position in the village, you know, that type Which thing. Which has been the common theme of all these women, uh, many of the women in the past. Oh, of course. You know. I guess it's a, you know. but I, it would, it kind of reminded me of Fourth Wing, but without the fun of the dragons. Okay. Like there were no dragons. Oh, then, yeah. So, uh, this book, I believe, was the start of a series. I don't know if I'm going to read the sequel, but that's just okay. me. So what did you think uh, overall? Overall, I think I rated it about a three. Okay. Like Out of it was five. Yeah. Okay. It okay. was entertaining. I would probably, if I'm truth be told, probably like a two point five. But like I said, I feel like I'm almost a little too too old for this type of book. Okay. So you might be a little judging it a little harsh. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah, especially if you've written a lot. You know, if you read a lot of books and you have a lot of books under your, you know, under your wing, it's sometimes it is hard when you read other when you read younger books or books by fledgling off authors or whatever. You know, right? I think this lady does have um, a romance or fantasy background. Supposedly, she wrote something called the Bridge Kingdom series, which I have not read. Mm -hmm. okay. So, yeah. So, All what's right. your first one, Lisa? Well, this one was is called One for the Blackbird and One for the Crow by Olivia Hawker. It's it's a long book, okay, and it's it's a book for somebody who's a laid back reader because it's a slow and easy read. However, um, it starts off really violently. Um, there's a character, um, the daughter, Beulah. She's probably around thirteen years old. She is lives in her own little world, her little world of imagination. She was, she was my favorite character in the book. She has this almost mythical relationship with animals, which is kind of odd for this book because it talks about surviving um, in 1897 in Wyoming on the prairie. Um, so that kind of is thrown into it. So it's a little unbelievable, but it, it makes it a little interesting as well. She's standing at the farm in the you know, at the farm, on the fence, looking at the animals in her own little dream world, and all of a sudden it's the silence is pierced by a shot. Um, her mother was having an affair with the neighbor's husband, oh. and her father came upon them, and he just lost his mind, and, you know, he reacted with violence and shot the, the husband. So Cora, who came from St. Louis, she, she grew up, they weren't really well to do, but she lived with her grandfather who raised her and they had didn't have the means for her to have a real coming out. They wanted her to marry well. She ended up marrying uh, Ernest and Ernest was just an average, you know, farmer, but he was a good man. He was kind. He provided well for his family and he took, but he took Cora to, to Wyoming in the middle of nowhere. And Cora really isn't a survivor. She doesn't really know how to farm or any of those things. So now Cora's in this position where she has, she has four children and she her husband is gone. Now, he went and turned himself in, but the town loved him so much that instead of putting him to, you know, hanging him, he got two years in prison. So now Cora has to survive for two years. So she throws herself at the mercy of Nettie Mae, who is the wife of the 
husband, the, man that the man she was having the affair with. Oh, nice. So poor Nettie Mae, she, of course, is like, you know, what are you, crazy? Do you want me to give you a hug and say everything's going to be fine? You, you know, you had an affair with my husband. My, now my husband's dead, and I have to get through this long, horrible winter. Right, so now you got these two women that are both trying to survive. Yes, so that's basically the whole premise of the story is these two women that are left without their husbands. Um, now, and Nettie Mae... Th- into the mix is a little jealous of Cora. Not only was she sleeping with her husband, but she, Cora's has four children. And Nettie Mae has one son, Clyde, who is also my other favorite character. Um, and and her other children have never made it past infancy. Oh, so she has okay. that factor as well. So it's that's the whole premise of the story. These two women have to basically, they have to come together. They have to learn how to work together in order to survive. Uh, Nettie May has more skills. She's a more of a homegrown uh, woman. She's lived in the, um, you know, she's lived this life. But Cora, Cora's pretty helpless. You know, Cora's uh, was always gotten by on her looks. She never really had a lot of the skills. Um, but Nettie May does step up. She realizes that they're going to have to work together. So basically, the book is all about um, learning how to get all the everything that they need to survive the winter getting the crops in um and all of that she has the little kids out there using the scythe oh wow and everything and that's a big safety issue i know and they're like dad never you know father never let us use the scythe well cora can't can't do anything so it's up to the little kids to you know and that's another reason why Nettie may stepped in and helped because she realizes I have to help these kids as well. Right. So it kind of goes in a, it comes up full circle because Nettie May c- kind of takes over a little bit of the mothering of these children, which is, are the children she never really had. So I enjoyed it. It was, a like I said, it was a very slow paced um, book. There were a few parts of it I thought were a little unrealistic um, with the Beulah. And there's some things that happened between Clyde and Beulah. And I really liked that, that story. Um, it was good. I and enjoyed it. Nettie May is the scorned. N- Nettie May is the scorned woman. Yes, and wow. I give her a lot of credit for being able to, uh, c- but come full circle and and you know take Cora and her family under her wing wow. in a way. Sounds like Cora should just go home and, and help leave yeah. her kids with Nettie May. And Cora wanted to go back, but she was raised by her grandfather. She had nowhere to go because he had passed away since. So she wa- she wanted to go back to St. Louis with her kids, but she there was no way that she could. Hmm. Um, but I and I loved Beulah um, and and Clyde because they also had this really neat relationship with horses, um, and I loved animals. And she was able to nurture animals. And there's this one part in the book. Um, where one of the sheep, this is the part of the book I didn't like, but one of the sheep is born with two heads. Wow. And, and, and of course, Beulah loves it and doesn't want anything to happen to it. And Cora has to go and slaughter the sheep. Oh, boy. So it's like this really, really <laughs> graphic scene. But I'm sure things like that did happen, and they thought it was this evil, demonic thing. I wonder right, if there's you know? any symbolism in the two-headed so, sheep for this yeah, story. Yeah, so I, I, I liked it. I, I, I'd probably give it a four. Okay. Oh, nice. You know, so. So with Goodreads, it gave it a 4.25 out of 5. Okay. Nice. All right. So as we all know, we have an eclipse coming. Okay. Really? (laughs) Yeah. I I had no idea. Here in uh, Rochester, we are in the path of totality. So my book club this past month read a book called He Said, She Said by Aaron Kelly, and it was very eclipse-themed. Um, actually, the whole way this book was written and structured, it was all structured around, like, first contact was the first part of the book. Second oh. contact, you know, That's like, really each stage of the clip. Yeah, that was, that was, I read this book, actually, a couple years ago. I think it came out probably closer to when the 2017 eclipse mm-hmm. came out. But um, that was the one thing that really struck in my mind. And when trying to come up with an eclipse scene book that had enough copies in the system for my book club, this is the one that um, came up. So I actually read it again. Okay. And there is a young couple. Here's the setup. So it's the summer of 1999. Kit and Laura are a young couple, and they are traveling to a festival in Cornwall to see a total eclipse of the sun. Kit is like an eclipse chaser. 
You've heard of storm chasers? Yeah, well, it? this book brought to light of there's a whole culture of people that literally travel to go see these things. Mm-hmm. They're obsessed. Yeah. With they come them. from all over. Like they're coming here. Yeah. And there's like festivals and things. And that's what they were going to do is they were going to run like a little coffee cart or something. And there was some farmer had let out his field. So they were having like this eclipse festival. Mm -hmm. So they're certain that, you know, this is going to be kind of a lifestyle thing for this. But and they were disappointed because it was cloudy. So it wasn't like the best possible Hmm. eclipse that sounds like it might be viewing. familiar <laughs> yeah oh, hopefully geez. this is not a premonition but um as they were enjoying the eclipse and wandering around you know the atmosphere afterwards laura sees a man and a woman and feels that a sexual assault is taking place so she calls the police and this starts this whole other part of the story which was who was this woman who was the victim? Why did she get so involved? The man, of course, that is accused of the sexual assault is from a very wealthy, prominent mm-hmm. family. So there's a whole trial and mm-hmm. what happens to the rape victim, you know, um, Laura, who witnessed the crime, how she's treated on the witness stand. And this is all in Great Britain. Mm -hmm. So it's a little bit different, but yet, unfortunately, a lot of the same things that happen in our courtrooms happen there, especially when it comes to a power imbalance of when you have a wealthy person that's Mm -hmm. accused of a crime. She sounds like a case I can think of here. (laughs) So so the victim at first seems very grateful that Mm -hmm. Laura has gotten involved because she was so... She was almost in shock, so she couldn't even speak for herself at the beginning. Um, So that didn't really help her case. But later, things start to happen within Kit and Laura's own relationship, and this victim shows up on their doorstep and becomes kind of ingrained in their life. Mm -hmm. So she's starting to wonder, like, did I trust the right person? Did I make the right decision revolving this? So then we flash forward 15 years Kit and Laura are now living under assumed names, completely off the digital grid. No Facebook, no cell phones, mm. um, not in any directories. She's uh, Laura's got to be very careful about how she does her, her work so mm-hmm. that she's never on the Internet. But um, there's another eclipse coming. Laura is oh, pregnant wow. with twins, and her husband, Kit, decides that he really wants to go. You know, he's seen all these eclipses, like with his father, you know, Mm -hmm. so he's going to go. So that begins like the twisty thriller thing, like where, where is this woman who was the victim? Her name is Beth. What is going to happen now that Laura is alone, Kit is off on this jaunt, and you begin to find out their secrets and what happened previously in their relationship so it, it ended up being kind of a twisty thriller mm-hmm. type of thing. It kept me reading. It was entertained. Do I think this was the best book ever written? No. But a lot of people seem to like these thrillers. Yeah. And I really thought the way it was structured was interesting. What I really didn't like was none of these characters were likable. Oh. Like, it was kind of like a Gone Girl thing for me. Yeah, that's the worst, because that's how I feel about the book I'm going to talk about in a minute. Yeah, so yeah. that was the thing, and that was that was the um, the verdict from my book club, too, are people that can read books about people they don't like and just are entertained by the, the train of action, mm-hmm. like the book. Yeah. The people that wanted to have some sort of connection to these characters – didn't like the book but i will say it kept us talking for at least 45 50 minutes Mm. and for a thriller that's pretty difficult and i do think it was the way the secrets are but also a lot of us were fascinated by this guy who was this eclipse chaser and what his family used to do Mm. and what he did and all these other people that seem to be interested in this so yeah that's funny because yeah it kind of it's going to piggyback on what i'm going to say a little bit about this one 
Okay. Huh. So what is your next well, one then? I read this book. I just was kind of fascinated by the title and I read a little bit about it. And I used to like this author. His name was Tim Robbins and he wrote these wild stories um, like Even Cowgirls Get the Blues and Still Life with um, Woodpecker and Jitterbug Perfume. I, I read those back in the 90s and those I loved his work. And so this kind of struck me a little bit like it could be like that. They This is the book of hidden things by Francesco um, Dimitri and they call him like the Neil Gaiman, the Italian Neil Gaiman. Um, but like, you know, I didn't, the narrator was a, 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 a guy named Fabio and I did not like him at all. I didn't like him. I thought he was just a pig. So, I mean, and I'll tell you why in a minute, but let it starts out with this pact that these guys make when they're um, teenagers, and, and it's all fired by the lead, their ringleader, and his name is Art. Now, Art made this pact that every year, at the same day and same time, they were going to meet at their favorite pizzeria, and... Um, they all they do they follow through with this they're now in their late 30s and they're still doing this so these the three guys um, show up at the restaurant and then art just never shows up so this is narrated by fabio and fabio um it's really interesting that as you're reading this you realize that almost everything that these guys do was all fueled by art by art his ideas so like fabio became a photographer because he wanted to see naked women uh, he wanted to get some of the girls he liked in town naked. So what better way to do that than to claim that you're an, a photographer who's right. interested in the female form. And this is Art's idea. Um, Moro becomes a lawyer in Milan, and he was, always was into fashion and everything. So he, he ended up in Milan, and he's a lawyer. He's a tax lawyer. He's the only one of them that... that got married and had had a couple of um, daughters and then there's um then there's tony and tony looks like a boxer he looks like he's a he's rugged and he's the guy that always was like you know trying to get start fights and things like that but he actually became a surgeon which is very strange and tony also is um he's gay so his family has accepted him um but they're they're they're, they seem interesting, right? They sound like interesting guys, but the dialogue and the, the way Fabio explains things, it just, it, it kind of ruined the story. It's a very, it starts out as a great premise. So now they're looking for art. I said he doesn't show up. And it's, they go to his house and they find that art, who used to dabble in selling marijuana, has now made this a huge part of his income. Okay. And unfortunately, the mafia, which is very prom prominent in this town, um, are not very happy with art. So they're looking for art. Art has found, has, has slept his way around. He's sleeping with married women and all these different women. He's, and he's ticked every one of them off because he's disappeared in their lives. So as these guys are looking for art, um, these women are coming forward and... It's just this one thing after another. But it's also interjected by this book of hidden things, which Art has written partially. They find it on his typewriter at his house. And then it, then they bring in the priest, and they now they think that the priest is involved with Art and his... Um, lucrative marijuana lucrative business. Lucrative marijuana business. <laughs> So it's it's just it's it's very it, there's parts of it that are very hard to follow. It's you're wondering what is going on. Are we even really looking for art? So it starts out like a kind of a mystery, but it's also a fantasy. It's very it's 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 just I don't know. It it kind of lost me. I I'd probably give it like a two. I'm assuming then, that was this written originally in Italian. Yes, and it's that's the other thing I found with books that are written in other languages. They just do not translate, translate well. Yeah. Well, no. I think when you have a, a complicated plot, mm -hmm. it sounds like this was trying to do a yeah. lot of different things. And and I didn't like like you know like I said I didn't like the narrator Fabio. He was a he was a low life. I mean, then he goes and has an affair with. Um, Marl's wife, who's been lusting after, and the the scenes were just so crudely written, and yeah. just I didn't like that. And then it really doesn't have an ending. So sometimes I don't mind a book that doesn't have an ending because it's built it up enough where you can kind of sort of imagine the ending. But this just kind of just ends, <laughs> and I'm like, what? And you kind of just wonder, 
What happened? Have you read, just out of curiosity, a lot of Neil Gaiman? Or do you like the way Neil Gaiman writes? I've only, I've, uh, I can't even remember. I, I read one of his books a long time ago. But he wrote, I remember him writing a lot like the Tim Robbins that I was talking about. Okay. His books are a wild ride, you know, and they just are all over the place. But I don't know. I just didn't like this I know book. Neil Gaiman wrote American Gods. Yes, yes. And I think I read The Ocean at the End of the Lane, which I liked a lot. Mm-hmm. It was a very weird book. Yeah. But it was very controversial because either either you like that book or you really hated that and book. And that's the thing with this one. And, yeah. and a lot of people didn't like it. And, you know, um, the same thing with this. You either liked it or you didn't. I think it I think it had a, like a three point something yeah, on Goodreads. Actually, it, it, oh, sorry. It seems like it was kind of claimed you know maybe 3.4 yeah okay. something like that yeah. but then i got on this tangent of yeah so it looks like francesco dimitri is italian yeah so yes. i'd imagine maybe i don't know maybe there's some uh you know, it, he writes a little fantasy. It's kind of a mix. It's like he doesn't yeah. know what he wants. Yeah. He's, 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 he's mystery, fantasy. There's a little horror thrown in. I don't know. It's just maybe I'm just a type of person that stick with your stick with your genre. I don't right. know. Well, sometimes it's good just to breach out. You know, sometimes yeah. it works. Sometimes I liked it, it doesn't. Yeah, I, exactly. I thought yeah. I'd try it and see what I thought. I think Claire might have a, a point there in the lot of, may get lost in translation and maybe right. the beauty yes, the of translation writing in Italian of it. doesn't really yep. cross over. Exactly. Yeah. It's just like, too, when you're watching movies now and you watch a movie on Netflix mm-hmm. and then, you know, I have to watch it with the subtitles because I can't stand it when they dub these things. Yeah. Yeah. It's the same thing, I think, with right. reading, you know. You miss a lot of the nuances. All right. So my last one is called um, the Rachel Incident by Caroline O'Donohue, and she is an Irish author. She's been compared a lot to Sally Rooney, who I know is very popular. Mm-hmm. I have not personally read any mm-hmm. Sally Rooney, mm-hmm. but um, I listened to this one on my way down to see my daughter this past weekend. I kind of picked it because I'd, I'd heard about this book like on different podcasts and things, and I also I was looking for a book that would fit in the, with the timeline mm-hmm. of when I was traveling. So this one was you know about nine or ten hours. I didn't really want something too long, and it is it's supposed to be a funny novel about friends, lovers, Ireland and chaos, and a young woman that is desperately trying to manage all three. So this was very much a coming of age novel. Mm-hmm. We start with Rachel. Rachel is a student working at a bookstore, and she meets one of her coworkers. His name is James. And they are, like, instantly bonded to each other. Um, Rachel is, like, young, heterosexual. James, on the other hand, is a young gay man who has not come out publicly, um, But they decide they're going to room together. Like Rachel's looking for a way to get out of her parents' house. Um, James is looking for a roommate. So together they begin this friendship that changes really the course of their lives. They are running riot through the streets of Cork, trying to maintain a very bohemian existence. But there's a big financial crash that happens during this time period. And Ireland is really depressed really in a recession very hard to get work even if you have a you know like rachel's getting an english degree Mm -hmm. which she kind of jokes about that a lot like what am i going to do with that anyway Uh, yeah i have Um, one of those myself (laughs) and um james is not enrolled in college at all james came from a very working class background parents like not a very stable family life so even though rachel's family is struggling i believe her father was a dentist you know, very different mm-hmm. class and family structure. So Rachel is in class, and she has a mad crush on one of her professors who is married. And she finds out working at the bookstore, he comes in one day and asks about pre-orders of a book, which he has written. So they devise this grand scheme to have like an author visit at their bookstore mm-hmm. promoting this book that really no one has really any interest in like they create like dead people 
and <laughs> or ha, or have these people like pre-ordered this book to kind of <laughs> convince the bookstore owner that oh that this is going to be a great thing yeah. great thing for the store um <laughs> But unfortunately, the night of the event, something happens. And I don't really want to give it away, but mm -hmm. that event will then morph into something that will chase these two throughout their, their friendship and the rest of this book. Um, so naturally, there are secrets. Um, you learn a lot about Ireland. Mm -hmm. Then, uh, like I said, I listened to this book, and the narrator was fantastic. She had that Irish accent down, and there were certain parts of this book that I was literally l driving and laughing out loud, like that That's were so great. funny. Um, but then once you get into the story, there's also a lot of sad and very serious things that are addressed in this book. Um, Rachel does eventually get a boyfriend. There is a unwanted pregnancy that occurs in the book, and in Ireland during this time, like women, like abortion was totally illegal. Mm -hmm. So then you have these young Irish women in a depressed time period that are trying to get to England to have an abortion or have any kind of medical services because it can't happen there. Um, so there were some things that kind of disturbed me. Like Rachel, I thought, was very, very selfish mm -hmm. in a lot of ways and didn't really – See, but then I wonder, like, am I judging her unfairly? Because she was. She was still in university. Mm -hmm. She was still. Yeah. You make a lot. Everybody makes a lot of stupid life decisions when they're. I think that's part of the problem, too, when I read some of the books, because I'm, you know, older and I look at some of the things these girls are doing. And sometimes I'll be like, what are you doing? You know, and, and you get really annoyed. <laughs> right. She's like in her 20s for the most part. Yeah. 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 It's, it's hard, like, to say, OK, wait a minute, step back and right. think about it. So, um. But then, like, a, you, you fast forward a little bit to a timeline when you know in the beginning of the book that Rachel has gotten married. She's having a baby oh. with her husband, and she runs into someone at a pub, and she's also a successful journalist. Mm -hmm. And James, she has maintained her friendship with James. James is now a writer. I kind of picture it for something like Saturday Night Live. Like, he was always really funny, and he got an internship for... Oh, like for for comedy, but like an undeveloped or unnoticed group, mm -hmm. you know. So being a, a gay man, Irish, you know, he kind of fit into that category. So you learn like what happened, like what happened was the event that caused their friendship to kind of fracture. You know, she's now in England. James is in the United States. Um, but there's definitely there's a lot of topics about sexuality, abortion, power disparity and relationships uh, and class were explored here. If you if you don't like the F word, it totally does not bother me, mm -hmm. but I know some people are offended by that. So, you know, warning, there is language in this book, but um, I did like it. I probably liked it better than any book and it really, I wanted to know what happened. Mm -hmm. Didn't agree with everything they did. But I really wanted to know what and happened that's to good. these if you, people. If, if you, you know, you didn't care, you wouldn't. Right, it's, right. You wanted to know. And I think by the end of the book, I kind of gave Rachel some grace, you know, because I could remember back to yeah. the time when yeah. I was, you know, or seeing, you know, what your kids go through or whatever. And it's like, yeah, nobody that's has There's a lot it. going on in that book. Yeah. It is a lot going on. It's funny because my next book is also set in, in Ireland. Oh, and, and we there didn't was, even plan this. And there was a lot going on in this. I have to tell you, I love this book. Um, I saw a lot of things in here that really hit, resonated with me. Um, it's The Lost Bookshop by Evie Woods. And it, it says, how far will you go to find your story? And it, it's, it goes back and forth between... Um, various characters it starts in the 1920s with opaline and opaline is living in london and her f father has passed away and her brother um who is well i won't say much about him because i don't want to ruin the spoiler but he um he's been in the war so you kind of at first think well you know he's seen a lot and we have to give him a little we have to cut him some slack but he just turns out to be a horrible person um 
he wants her to marry uh, one of his war buddies, and she doesn't have any desire for that. She wants adventure, and she loves reading, and she has a flair for finding books that are, are, are worth a lot of money. So she runs off to get away from this um, marriage, and she runs to Paris, and she only has as much money as she got for the book she traded. And she meets Sylvie, and she meets Armand, and Armand is a um, an antiquary. You know, he he deals in books, and they kind of have this. They they start out as friends, and then it becomes a fling. But her brother finds her, and she has to go and flee. And this is where we get in. We this is where we wind up in Dublin. Um, so what time period is this? So this is the 1920s with Opaline. Oh wow! Okay, and so she runs off to Dublin. So and you're talking like World War One, yes? Like he brother was in World, was in World, World War One. Okay, um, so that's why you kind of feel like, oh, okay, you know, you kind of feel a little bad for the guy, but then you, you don't. Then we cut to Martha, and Martha is escaping an abusive marriage, and she has run off to Dublin as well, and she's she finds a job working. Um, in a home for Madam, oh my goodness, I can't remember her name, but she's, she's, she works as a house housemaid. So she gives her a place to live, and the first day she looks out the window, and then now we have Henry who enters the picture. Henry sees her, and of course, right off the bat, he it's love at first sight. Uh, Henry is all is looking for this lost bookshop, so he's hit the the number that he has is eleven and a half, and this is twelve. So Henry's really puzzled right now as to where's this bookshop could possibly be, and she's look and she's just started this job, and she's like, who is this guy? She thinks he's a peeping tom, and he's she's like, what do you want? And he's like, well, I'm looking for a bookshop. She's like, I have no idea what you're talking about, and then he just goes off on his way. Um, but she she so so it goes back and forth between the relationship of. Um, with Martha, then we go back to Opaline and what's going on with Opaline in her life. So it's like a dual it's timeline dual story. dual timeline okay. story. And it's really, really good. At first, you know, it took a little bit to get into to follow it, but as, as soon as it got in, you got into it. There's so much fantasy built into this book. This is a fantasy. Um, because as, as time goes on, Martha's starting to notice cracks in the plaster. And the cracks in the plaster start turning into tree branches. And then the tree branches start turning into bookshelves. And then she reads this this book called The Lost Bookshop. And this is what kind of fuels this whole thing. Now, Martha is also looking for, um, no, not, not Martha, I just mixed it up. Opaline is looking for the transcript that she thinks is there for um, Emily Bronte's book. She thinks that Emily Bronte started writing a second book. Okay. So she's looking for that transcript. And and so this shop turns into this amazing, this shop is this amazing, um, it's like a tree, but it's a shop. It shows you what it wants to show you. The stained glass windows change into different things. Things appear. So when Opaline is living in this shop, she... She goes upstairs and the shop opens what it, what it wants to show her and there's a pair of trousers laying there. She's like, oh, I don't want to wear a dress. And she puts on the trousers. Then she cuts her hair and she's living in this bookshop and she's putting books out and then and then the treasures appear. It's just this magical shop that she's living in. So, so like this is a the lot shop of- that Henry is looking for. Okay. Because he's found this transcript, part of this transcript, the lost bookshelf shop. Okay. So it all kind of intertwines like the branches of the tree. It's really amazingly written. And the story unfolds like the tree does. And, and, and the w- wild part of the whole thing is that Henry does finally see the shop. And he, Henry and Martha are the only ones that, that see the shop that can see the bookshop and also madam and i can't remember her last name isn't i have it all written down but madam that she's working for she's the only one that can see madam and henry's the only one that can see her i won't say any more about that no one else sees madam so it's just it unfolds amazingly there is such a good twist there's there, there's so many twists at the end things that you do not see coming and you're just like wow so in a way it's a little bit of a thriller too it's a mystery it's 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 a um, fantasy and there's a little bit of an aspect of, of it being a thriller it's like one example i'll just give you one little um it won't ruin it but 
um, Martha's husband tracks her down. And he is going to take her back. He's going to drag her. Well, first he tells her that her mother's dying of cancer to try to get her to come home. He's a really lovely person. Then he, he comes back, and he's going to physically bring her home. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, he just trips and falls and breaks his neck on the stairs. <laughs> so how did she's not sure how she thinks Madam did it. Madam did it. And Madam says to her, I want you to go out and do the shopping right now. And I just, just go do the shopping. Don't worry, I'll take care of everything. So when she gets home, everything's cleaned up. The banister's not broken. There's no more blood. And the inspector comes to the door and says, oh, we found a body in the, in the river. So they just think, basically, he got drunk and fell into the river. Ooh. So, but, so Madam covers it all up. And but wait till you see what happens at the end. It's just it's it's an amazing book. All right, so good. It really is. I give it a five out of five, and I want to actually. It's one of those books I would read again. Okay, because well, there's so that's high praise. There is. There's really so much. There's so much in this book, and the shop that she writes about is like my dream shop. It has books and antiques and everything. I mean that's always like always, all of your favorite things. That was always into one. that was always my dream of having a bookshop and a um, antique shop rolled into one. Wow! And, and yeah, <laughs> kind of wanted to be Martha. All right, but not Opaline. Well, we've got some Irish books. A little bit late for St. Patrick's Day, but um, some hopefully interesting reads here yes. that uh, we chose that will resonate with you. And join us later in the month. I'm going to have a visit with one of my college friends who is an avid reader. So that'll be a virtual visit. But we're going to hear about what she's reading these days. Um, so thanks for joining us. And we will see you next time. Thanks, Lisa. For Thank you. Thank guest. you for having me. I yeah. really enjoyed it. Oh, good. Book Break is a production of the Greece Public Library. Made possible through the support of the friends of the Greece Public Library. Theme music composed and performed by Sean Greif.